And the search is on as we're coming on the air for any survivors in Hawaii. Dozens of people are dead from wildfires that have decimated a historic city on Maui. Gone is the green, only gray and ash now. We're reporting live on the island, and we'll hear from a local business owner who says this just doesn't feel real. Also breaking tonight, five Americans stuck for years in an Iranian prison may finally have a path back home. The details we're getting from Washington and Tehran about a proposed swap. And then just in from the Supreme Court, the justices pausing a deal that would protect the family behind drug maker Purdue Pharma from being sued for opioid-related claims. Why the Biden administration pushed for that hold. Plus, new court documents laying out the government's timeline for former President Trump's election fraud trial. Will his team go along with the January date? And in tonight's original, can painting your house the whitest of white slow the impact of climate change? Researchers say yes, and they showed our team how it can help save you some money, too, and protect people from rising temperatures. That's later in the show. Hey, everybody, I'm Aaron Gilchrist in for Halley today. We come on the air tonight with a race against time. Officials surveying the damage in Maui as wildfires there burn out of control, destroying basically everything in their path. We know at least 36 people are dead across the island, and that number could go up. And take a look at this, the scene there, like a war zone, nothing but burned cars, concrete beams of what once were houses. This, that's just as far as the eye can see. These are some satellite images from just over two weeks ago of the Lahaina main area. It was once the capital of the Kingdom of Hawaii. Let me show you what it looks like now. Just gray. Burned to the ground in so many places, no boats in the harbor, and the loss for many of the people there goes deeper than just these material things. I want you to hear from one man who lost his father's ashes to the flames. Because that's the one thing I wanted to hold on to forever. And now he's just in the ground with all the other ashes, and that was probably the toughest. More than 2,000 people are spending the night in shelters. More than 11,000 have already left the island. The airport there is packed. People trying to escape now. Some airlines offering cheap flights to other islands, while other airlines are flying in empty planes to get people out. We're also getting a first look at how they're fighting this fire. National Guard helicopters are picking up water from what looks like a reservoir. Then they dump it over the fire to try to put out the flames there. These two planes emptied about 60 buckets in roughly five hours. That's more than 100,000 gallons of water. Now we have meteorologist Michelle Grossman on how the weather is impacting the fires. And we'll have a local business owner joining us shortly as well. But first, let's get to Dana Griffin, who is on the ground in Maui, where obviously it's really windy right now. Dana, give us a sense of, of what it's been like there in the thick of all this. I know there's a lot we don't know at this point, but what are you hearing? Well, I can tell you that that wind gust just picked up. Uh, we've seen some rain off and on today. We are seeing hundreds of people show up here in one of the largest evacuee centers in Maui. Many grateful that they are still alive and that they were able to escape those flames. I talked to one couple who had to walk 15 miles on foot to get to safety. Take a listen. We came off the street and got housing. That was the housing we had. And so now, back on the street, so that's tough at our age. The we feeling had, of security. We on the street, so we didn't have much to begin So it was the feeling of security. Uh, and that couple walked away saying that they lost their home. It was a neighbor that actually texted them to let them know their home was destroyed. We actually just got an update from the Maui Fire Department. The fires that are burning on the island are now 80% contained, Aaron. That is major progress considering that the the, the winds that they experienced Wednesday have significantly died down, allowing them to try to contain this fire. They still have a ways to go. The areas where those fires are currently burning, still no access for media or anyone else unless you're a resident. So we hope to try to get into that burn zone to get a better picture of how this fire really destroyed the lives there. Yeah, 80% though really is some good news in terms of containment. Obviously, I know that doesn't mean the fires are out, but at least they are getting an upper hand in some cases. Uh, Dana, President Biden also addressed the fires at a, an event today. This is an unrelated event. I want to play a little bit of what he had to say. Our prayers with the people of Hawaii, but not just our prayers. Every asset we have will be available to them. And we've seen, they've seen their homes, their business destroyed, and some have lost loved ones. And it's not over yet. 
So, Dana, I think I saw a federal disaster declaration for Hawaii. What happens next here? What's the next move to get this uh, taken care of? Well, the next move is to finish the firefighting activity, to try to get containment around that, to go in, assess the damage, and figure out how much is needed and how much other federal assistance will be brought in. It's estimated that this fire, the three fires burning on Maui, are going to cost at least a billion dollars. That is very significant, and this has been a very unprecedented fire. And then it's going to be the, the, the effort to get people back to their homes or people whose homes have been destroyed to rebuild and try to get back to normal. But Aaron, that is likely to take years. All right, Dana Griffin for us on Maui tonight. Dana, thank you. I want to bring in our guest now, Alexa Kasky, also from Maui. Uh, she's joining us. Alexa, uh, thank you for, for talking to us today. I have to ask first just, you know, how are you doing? How are you feeling with everything that's going on there? I know you saw the flames get pretty close to where you live. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing okay given the situation. Um, I, I think that my home is okay. I'm not positive. I think my business has survived, but that definitely isn't the case for most people. So I'm trying to like put together my efforts right now to see what I can do to get people shelter immediately. That's, you know, people's most immediate need. And then after that, when we can get back and start feeding people who need you know, I, I, I've, I've been to Maui, and I know that po folks there, uh, there's a, an, a tremendous sense of community, and people are, are looking to, to try to be as helpful as they can. Obviously, when something as tragic as this happens, you would imagine that that's e even more so the case. I know you have a business there as well. Uh, are you just sort of thinking about how can I help, or are you thinking about potentially heading out too? I'm not going anywhere. Um, we're going to do everything we can to help feed everybody who needs it. And right now, too, I'm trying to organize um, coordinating people who don't have homes anymore and anybody mm. who has like a spare bedroom or, a, you know, a vacant rental property, which are kind of few and far between out here. But trying to get people into beds and out of shelters where they can, you know, at least start to put things back together because the shelters are overwhelmed right now and they're struggling for resources. So getting people into actually actual homes I think is one of the main priorities right now. And there are a lot of people who are watching this program uh, across the country right now. If there's something that you could say to folks who are looking at what's going on there from afar, if you had one message for the rest of the country about this situation in Hawaii right now, uh, what do you want people to know? Oh, my goodness. I don't know. I'm kind of in shock still. It just it doesn't seem real. It's so hard to fathom that I think at least 75% of the homes in Lahaina are completely gone, which is displacing thousands of people. All the historic buildings that people remember from ever going on vacation to Lahaina are gone. Front Street, for the most part, is completely gone. Um, I guess the, the rebuild efforts are going to start soon, and we're going to, you know, try to get through this. Well, it's good to know that the community has folks like you who have restaurants and you're willing to help out as much as you can and try to get that rebuilding mm -hmm. work in, uh, underway. So, Alexa, thank you so much for talking to us, and we wish you the best. Thank you. I want to bring in meteorologist Michelle Grossman now. Uh, Michelle, you've been tracking the weather in this area. What's the situation looking like potentially contributing to these fires? When, when is it going to get better? Hey there, Aaron. Well, it's going to get better. It is starting to get better. You saw in Dana's live shot, it's a little breezy right now, not the gusty winds we had yesterday. So yesterday we had the area of high pressure, Hurricane Dora, which is a Category 4 storm south of the islands, kind of interacting together to bring some really gusty winds. We saw winds 60, 70, 80 miles per hour right over the islands. Unfortunately, the islands were sandwiched right in between. In addition to that, we have very dry vegetation. We're in a drought. We have been in a drought. We're going to continue to be in a drought. And also relatively low humidity yesterday, so that all came together perfectly, really imperfectly, if you want to say that, to create this disaster, unfortunately. Now, as we go throughout over the next 24 hours, we're starting to see the winds come down. We're seeing some gusty winds right now, about 21, 22 miles per hour, better than 38 we saw earlier today, better than the 80 we saw yesterday. And then as we go throughout time here, we're going to see those winds continue to die down. So all high wind warnings, wind advisories, wind watches have been dropped. Also, red flag warnings have been dropped as well. That's good news. That's a good sign that things are improving weather-wise. So as we go 
throughout uh, the evening here, we're looking at very dry winds on the leeward side of the islands with winds down to 10 miles per hour once we lose that sun energy by later on tonight. Aaron. All right, Michelle Grossman with us tonight. Michelle, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Some more breaking news now with the White House saying just a few hours ago that negotiations to bring five Americans detained in Iran home are ongoing and delicate. And this comes as we're learning that these three Americans you see on your screen here and two others who haven't been publicly identified were moved to house arrest. According to sources with knowledge of the matter, this is part of a planned prisoner swap. The National Security Council saying in a statement that this is an encouraging step in a possible deal between Tehran and Washington. Now, under the proposed deal, as we understand it, the Iranian government would get access to some $6 billion blocked by U.S. sanctions in exchange for these prisoners. Iran would be able to use that money only on food, medicine, and other humanitarian purposes. Dan Deleuze has been tracking this story throughout the day and joins us now. So, Dan, uh, back in March, Iran's top diplomat said that a prisoner swap was close. The U.S. immediately called that a cruel lie at the time. So help us understand, you know, what's changed now? What, what are the political implications of a deal like this? Well, we don't exactly know what changed. The formula for this has been around for months, and the discussions have been on and off for some time with Qatar playing an intermediary role. What we do know is that this is a major decision for both countries, especially President Biden he is going to face, obviously, fierce criticism from Republicans over this arrangement for this prisoner exchange. But I think there was a decision that this could help diffuse tensions with Iran somewhat, and it was perhaps the only way to get those Americans home. You know, Dan, uh, Tehran's uh, uh, even prison is, is notorious, we know, for abuse, for harsh conditions. Back in December, Andrea Mitchell talked to the daughter of Murad Tabaz, one of the Americans detained, about how difficult it's been for her family. I want to play a little bit of that, and then we'll talk about it. It's been a nightmare that you couldn't imagine, and I think, you know, every opportunity we get to hear their voices, you know, you savor it because you don't know what can come, and it's... We're taking it day by day to try to get them home and do everything that we can on this side to bring them back to us. So, Dan, what can That's you tell right. us about, I was going to say, what can you tell us about these Americans and, and, and their families? Uh, you can hear the, the pain in her voice. These families have been suffering for years, and there have been uh, hopes raised at times, and then everything has collapsed. Um, I, I think they do see this as a positive step, a first step, but they know there's a long road to go. This could take weeks to play out while they wait in Tehran. And uh, Imad Shargi's family, uh, they issued a statement and they said they had faith in President Biden and government officials and the work they were undertaking, and they were hopeful. But again, there is a long road to go here, and this could take four weeks, maybe five weeks, as those funds are transferred. All right, we know you'll be tracking it uh, throughout Dan Deleuze for us in our D.C. newsroom. Thank you, Dan. Let's get to some more breaking news just into us in the last hour or so. The Supreme Court putting the bankruptcy reorganization of Purdue Pharma, the maker of OxyContin, on hold. That's after the Biden administration objected to a part of the deal that protected the Sackler family that controls the company from liability. The family had agreed to pay $6 billion toward opioid-related lawsuits, but only as long as they were shielded from any future cases against the company. Now, we've talked about it on this show. OxyContin is that powerful painkiller that was marketed aggressively by Purdue Pharma, arguing it was not addictive. The opioid crisis that followed has killed tens of thousands a year over the last decade. NBC's Lawrence Hurley joins me now. Uh, Lawrence, so where does this case go from here? What are the implications for the Sackler family? So for now, this just puts everything on hold. This was just a preliminary decision by the Supreme Court. It said in this brief court order that uh, the bankruptcy reorganization plan will remain on hold while it hears oral arguments in December and then issues a ruling, which will probably be in January. And, you know, the underlying issue here is kind of a dry question of bankruptcy law. Uh, which, you know, is in uncertain around the country. So the, this ruling will provide some certainty on that. But people are obviously going to be focusing much more on this Purdue uh, bankruptcy deal. Uh, the company itself was disappointed by the court's decision to intervene on this, putting out a statement just earlier, um, actually criticizing the U.S. bankruptcy trustee, which is the sort of 
uh, federal kind of overseer of these uh, bankruptcy proceedings um, who um, brought this appeal uh, and basically saying that this decision is going to hold up uh, funds being distributed to victims of the opioid crisis. Um, but of course, the Supreme Court's decision is ultimately going to decide whether this goes forward. And, uh, you know, there are other people who uh, have opposed this deal. So there will eventually be some certainty on this sort of early next year. All right. Lawrence Hurley covers the Supreme Court for us. Lawrence, we appreciate it. Thank you. We are learning just in the last couple of hours that prosecutors want to ring in the new year by starting former President Donald Trump's trial here in D.C. January 2nd is their proposed date for a jury to start hearing the case alleging Trump tried to overturn the 2020 election based on lies about fraud. The government says a trial could take something like four to six weeks, and that's where things are going to get tricky for the former president, because mid-January is when the early states start to vote. So if he's in court, that means he cannot be on the campaign trail for the Iowa caucuses on January 15th. Garrett Haig is joining me now to walk us through this. We know that uh, Trump's team has until next week to respond to this January 2nd date idea. Conventional wisdom would tell us, or would it tell us, that, you know, they're going to do whatever they can to delay the start of this trial? Oh, absolutely. They don't want to start in early January, and not just because they'd still have the New Year's Eve hangover. They want to push <laughs> this thing off as long as they possibly can. Trump's lawyers have suggested that they should push it off two and a half years, because that's how long the Justice Department had to bring this case. But that timeline is just not going to work for them, in part for the reason you laid out. It is right in the heart of the primary season. You wouldn't just miss Iowa, but he'd potentially be off the trail for all the early states. I don't see that flying. They're going to put forward dates much further down the line, and the judge is going to rule in the next in-person, the next real hearing in this case on August 28th. We'll see where it lands. I bet it'll be sometime in the 2024 calendar year, but that's about all I could tell you right now. Okay, let's talk about Florida, the, the documents case in Florida. We're just getting some sketches uh, from today's hearing on the, the classified documents case. I think we can put them up on the screen. You can see Trump's two alleged co-conspirators uh, in the image here, Walt Nada, who pleaded not guilty, and Carlos de la Vera, who could not enter a plea because he doesn't have a lawyer, a local lawyer there in Florida yet. And that means another delay in the hearings here. Is there a sense that a, a delay strategy is, is really starting to unfold here? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's the one consistent strategy across all of Donald Trump's legal cases that he faces now, and frankly, that he's faced since he became a public figure in the 80s. I mean, this is really how he's always operated in the legal sphere. You either counter sue, which you can't really do in a criminal case, mm -hmm. or you try to delay as much as possible and just hope the other side basically punches themselves out. In this case, he could also end up winning the presidency again and make these cases go away. So he, and in this case, his co-conspirator, are operating under a pretty similar guidebook here. The later they can push this into next year, the better they think their chances are. And if that means not being able to find a lawyer in South Florida where criminal lawyers are a dime a dozen, yeah. so be it. All right, we'll see if it works. Garrett Higg for us today. Garrett, thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Michigan's case against suspected fake 2020 electors moving forward tonight now that all 16 defendants have pleaded not guilty. They're accused of trying to illegally forge documents stating Donald Trump won Michigan's 16 electoral college votes when they actually went to Joe Biden. Now, the state alleges the defendants, including current and former Republican and elected officials, signed their names to certificates claiming they were the legitimate members of the electoral college. They even showed up to try to deliver some of those certificates. You can see some of them here outside the state capitol. This is in December of 2020. Now, all of this ties into the charges we saw filed against former President Trump last week. The Justice Department accusing him of pushing the fake elector scheme in several states, including Michigan. NBC's Shaquille Brewster is outside the courthouse in Lansing, Michigan, for us now. So, Shaq, uh, all of these defendants pleading not guilty, they were, they were literally seen on camera being denied entry into the Michigan Capitol back in December of 2020. We just showed that. What sort of defense are they going to be offering up here in this case? Well, you're hearing different defenses from these attorneys, one saying that this is a political prosecution, others going after the merits of this case. Let's start with the accusation here, because the attorney general is uh, filing charges or has filed charges against these defendants on eight different counts. Three of the counts related to forgery for essentially drafting a false document and making false statements. You see some of those on your screen, that maximum 14-year penalty. Three of the counts connected to uttering and publishing, essentially uh, using and 
publishing and mailing that document to Washington, D.C., and then two of those counts connected to this being related to election law. You went through the accusation from the attorney general that they were essentially trying to defraud the state of Michigan. Listen to a little bit of what we're hearing from the defenses, from the defense uh, through the defense attorney. They were trying to preserve, it appears, these individuals, an objection and then have that objection ruled upon by the, uh, by the Vice President of the United States. If the outcome of that challenge was that the challenge failed, then his elector signature would never be used. That was his understanding. That's what he was told. Therefore, there is no crime here. He went on to say that his client didn't even see the elector, uh, the certificate of votes, the document where they were claiming to be electors. He says that his client just simply saw a blank page with lines on it and was told to sign and that he was advised never uh, that this document wouldn't be used. So that's what you're likely going to hear in the weeks and months to come as this process plays out through motions hearings and also a, an eventual trial. We know that these are Republican officials, some of them current sitting officials, one of them a sitting mayor in the state of Michigan. This is something that is top of mind for people here and will be watched across the country because this scheme was not just done here in Michigan, but in about six other states across the country back in 2020, Aaron. All right, we know you'll be watching it closely too for Shaquille Brewster in Michigan tonight. Shaq, thanks. A Kremlin source today telling NBC News that Russian President Vladimir Putin is weighing whether to go to next month's G20 summit in India. Now, it would be Putin's first face-to-face -face meeting with Western leaders since Russia invaded Ukraine almost 18 months ago now. And it is a high-stakes decision, setting up a potentially tense situation and a risk of humiliation on a global stage with Western leaders opposed to the Russian invasion and questions from foreign journalists, too. Our chief international correspondent, Keir Simmons, broke the story for NBC News. He's joining us now. Uh, so, Keir, uh, you know, you sort of wonder what would make Putin want to attend an event like this. What's at stake for him? What do we know about his considerations in making a decision? Well, I think you set out the, the risks there, Aaron, uh, very eloquently. Uh, ultimately, he worries that he's going to have to sit there and be you know, told about all of the things that the West believes that he's, he did wrong, it, it, that he would be shunned by President Biden and other uh, Western uh, leaders. In terms of why he might think that it's something that he would uh, want to do, if he can negotiate with India uh, to allow him to go without that happening and to have perhaps uh, some bilateral meetings with perhaps uh, Prime Minister Modi of, of India, uh, with perhaps Saudi Arabia or, or South Africa or Brazil, uh, all of uh, which did not vote uh, in favour of the sanctions against him at the UN uh, this year. They abstained. So it is a possibility. If he was able to sort of get that to happen, then keep in mind that President Putin is now nine months away from his election next year. He might well think that that's an opportunity to kind of stand on the world stage. Another challenge for him, of course, is uh, the uh, International Criminal Court wanting him for war crimes. Now, uh, South Africa, for example, is a signatory to the International Criminal Court, so he's cancelled a potential trip there for a conference this month. But India is not, just like the United States is not. So that, again, might be something that he thinks he is uh, going to be able to avoid the risk of, it, if you like, by going uh, to India. Listen, I suspect that he actually will decide not to go, that he would go, could be, be a peer uh, visually, but not in person. Uh, but we will see, and it's clear from a Kremlin source that we've spoken to, that he is still considering going. You have to wonder about how the rest of the world views even the, the potential for uh, a diplomatic relationship with Russia. You think back to 2014, uh, Putin attended the G20 in Australia under similar, somewhat similar circumstances after Russia's annexation of Crimea. Yeah. Putin, we see the picture right here. He was sidelined at that summit, sort of off to the side there. Does Russia still have uh, in any way a relevant uh, or at all welcoming seat at any world table now? Well, President Putin will believe that one of the things on his side will be time, because, of course, the, mm. counter, the Ukrainian counteroffensive counter is, is struggling. Uh, remember another example of a G20 back in 2018, 
uh, when uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, got a high five from President Putin just months after the, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. So President Putin will be viewing uh, geopolitics, if you like, as, as a long game. Uh, and he may well think uh, that going to a G20, uh, where if it's manufactured in the way that he wants, uh, will be advantageous uh, to him. It, it, it's possible. These are the kind of things they'll be weighing up in the Kremlin. All right. Well, I'll be watching what happens in India next month. Keir Simmons for us tonight. Keir, thank you. Coming up, new details in the stabbing death of a gay man after he danced at a New York City gas station. What officials are revealing tonight? Plus, the Mississippi Supreme Court is delivering a big loss for NFL Hall of Famer Brett Favre. We'll explain that coming up in our five things. Target is recalling millions of candles for the second time this year. We'll tell you why. That's coming up in our five things. First, though, we have some better than expected inflation numbers out today with a new report saying prices are still going up over 3% from this time a year ago, but that is less than what was expected. The categories that saw the highest price increases year over year, you know them, food, housing, transportation. It's fueling hope that the, Fed moves to, the Fed's moves to bring down inflation are working and maybe maybe they won't raise interest rates again. Brian Chung joins me now to help us understand what could happen, what is happening. Brian, walk us through these numbers here. Are, 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 there, are there areas where prices are actually going down? Yeah, Aaron, as is the case with economic data, there's a lot of nuance here. So let me just walk you through some of it. The number that we got this morning right here, 3.2%, that's how much more prices rose in July of this year compared to July of last year. And that is a bit of a faster pace than the 3% that we saw in the June to June period. Now, okay, on the surface, that might be a little bit concerning, but economists say some of this is just the mathematics. We're no longer comparing inflation rates to the worst that it was in the summer of last year, which is run one reason why this number looks a little bit bigger. But broadly speaking, Aaron, your point is right, that prices are still rising across the board when we look at food, energy, shelter, gasoline prices have been going up over the past two months. But this is the biggest expenditure for most Americans when you think about uh, mortgage payments and also rent payments. That is one reason why we're going to have to continue to watch if this number can come down. If that number comes down, maybe the overall rate of inflation comes down. Again, these are all positive, but we did see other categories with price declines over the month. Take a look at, for example, uh, washing machines and appliances in addition to footwear. So that's that's something encouraging for sneakerheads like me, I guess. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm sure that's that, <laughs> your eyes brightened up when you realized that, that was the case. Um, I want to ask, you know, we sort of compare things now. It's like it's it's either post pandemic, during the pandemic or pre pandemic. Right. A lot of people are wondering if there's a chance that prices will come back down to pre pandemic prices. What sort of a scenario would need to be coming together for that to happen? Well, the short answer, Aaron, is that in the aggregate for overall prices, we're not going to get back to pre-pandemic levels. Economists want to target it to a 2% rate, but that still implies that prices are rising just at a slower pace than we've seen. But I want to bring up some of the points for other things that we buy on a daily basis, because it's possible that in some price categories, you will see declines. So take a look at eggs, gasoline, milk. All of these prices, July of this year compared to July of last year, are cheaper. Eggs and gasoline, about a buck cheaper for a dozen or a gallon, respectively. Milk is tilted down by about a quarter uh, from over four bucks to just short of four dollars over the last year. But not everything is necessarily getting cheaper. Look at bread, for example, this increasing over the last year uh, by over 25 cents. So certainly it depends on what price categories you're looking at. But again, the goal for economists and for the Federal Reserve is not to get prices back to where they were pre pandemic. It's just to slow the massive pace of price increases that we've seen since the pandemic. So let me ask you this. You, you look at all the numbers, right? I mean, you, you, the Federal Reserve has said that it's going to be making decisions on interest rates based on things like inflation, job market data. Uh, what can we expect when we get this meeting next month with the Fed in September? What can we, what can we expect based on the available data? Yeah, and for what it's worth, they're going to be getting more data before they meet in the later part of September. But the talking point is, well, they were, were kind of thinking about perhaps pausing the pace of their interest rate increases. By the way, that's the reason why our mortgage rates, our credit card rates, our uh, business loan rates have been so high. You look at what they've been doing over the last year on the chart ahead of you, and you can see that they have been slowing the pace of their price increases. And in fact, in June, they even opted to not raise interest rates at all. So the Federal Reserve is looking at this inflation data 
data and saying, look, we're going to watch that number. We want it to continue to go down. Hopefully the unemployment rate can also stay low. That's what they're going to be looking for as they potentially raise or if the numbers look good, not raise interest rates in their next meeting in September, Aaron. All right, we'll see what happens. Brian Chung with us tonight. Brian, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, tonight kicks off one of the biggest political events of the year. No, it's not a debate or a big town hall. We are talking about the Iowa State Fair in Des Moines. Now, typically the largest gathering of candidates in the state ahead of its first in the nation caucuses, this fair gives Iowans a chance to gauge the political space, the politicians who show up really up close, right? How they embrace the traditions of butter sculptures and, and everything fried that they have at these fairs. Now, over roughly two weeks, Iowans will see virtually every major candidate descend on the fairgrounds there, a pretty rare sight, as candidates typically spread out among the early primary states. NBC's Dasha Burns is in Des Moines, Iowa for us now. Aaron, look, if you are running for president, coming to the Iowa State Fair is pretty much mandatory. This is where voters check to see if you're the real deal by eating all of the fried food you could possibly eat. I mean, just right here, you got your corn dogs, you got your root beer, cotton candy, fried cheese curds. I myself have already partaken in a little bit of a fried Oreo fest. Uh, but look, as much as this is the land of opportunity, it's where candidates can show voters that they are able to connect. It's also also full of landmines. Look, are you underdressed, overdressed? Are you eating the right fried food? Are you shaking the right hands? Are you are you making sure that you're being authentic? Because that's what Iowa voters are really looking for. And when I talk to the voters here, look, the reality is a lot of them are still very much open-minded and undecided about who they are planning to caucus for. So I ask them, what do they want to see in a candidate? What is going to win them over? Take a listen. I want them to say what they're going to do to help us. I don't care what anybody else has done or past presidents or current president. I just want to, you know, what are you going to do? Ones that are really actually going to follow through on their promises to help the community. They, always, they make a lot of promises and then they never follow through. Iowa is always important, but its importance cannot be overstated in this cycle because of the Trump factor. Look, if Trump wins Iowa, it is basically over. But if another candidate can come close or can win here, then the door starts to open. And while Trump is leading here, he's not leading by as big a margin in Iowa as he is nationally and his support here is softer and what does that mean it means that the voters that say they support him right now say they are still willing to consider other candidates to listen to what others have to say over the next five months which in political time is as like dog years it's a lot of time uh, before those january caucuses so there is an opportunity for others to win over these critical critical voters here aaron Dasha Burns for us in Iowa tonight. Let's get you to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a teenager has been indicted on hate crime charges in the murder of a New York City man. O'Shea Sibley, was, uh, who was gay, was stabbed to death last month after dancing at a gas station. Witnesses say a group hurled homophobic slurs at Sibley and his friends moments before the killing. A 17-year-old is in custody for that crime. The person's name has not been released. Number two, Mississippi's Supreme Court says it is not going to remove Brett Favre from a lawsuit seeking to recover millions of dollars in welfare funds. Now, this is tied to allegations that the NFL great was among dozens of people who received money meant for Mississippi's poorest residents. This is a civil case. No criminal charges have been filed here. Favre's legal team has denied any wrongdoing. Number three, the video game streamer who sparked chaos in New York City last week says the riot was, quote, not his intention. Kai Sinat used social media to call people to Union Square Park in the hopes of getting a free PlayStation 5. Now, that stunt led to crowded streets, smashed cars, dozens of arrests here. Sinat said the giveaway was supposed to be fun. Now he's facing several charges. Number four, more than two million candles sold at Target stores are being recalled. The glass jars used for the Threshold brand products can break during normal use, causing burns and cuts. Similar issues led to five million candles being pulled off shelves in May. Anybody with one of these affected candles can get a refund. 
At number five this fall, it is 1989 all over again. Taylor Swift's version, that is. Swift announced that she is re-recording her hit album. Now, this follows a trend by the singer since she lost the rights to her master recordings. The new album is slated to drop October 27th and features five new unreleased tracks. When we come back, Ecuador under a state of emergency tonight after a presidential candidate was assassinated. But the country's president is blaming for the attack. Plus, it's being called a transportation disaster in Kentucky, while the state's largest school system is being forced to cancel classes. So just in the last half hour, we're learning that former President Trump's social media company, Truth Social, it flagged the FBI about threatening posts on that platform made by a Utah man killed in a raid earlier this week. Now, you're seeing the first video we have of that raid. This is minutes after the FBI shot the man as they tried to serve him an arrest warrant. The man, apparently a big fan of the former president, allegedly posted a lot of threats against President Biden, against the district attorney in Manhattan, New York, Alvin Bragg, and other Democrats. Remember, this happened just hours before President Biden visited Utah. Tom Winter is joining me now with the latest on this. So, Tom, uh, talk us through what we know about this truth social involvement now. And, and, and I understand there's some new details about the suspect's arrest history, too. That's right, Aaron. So you remember last night when we were speaking about this uh, this incident shortly after it happened, we talked about the fact that a social media company had tipped off federal law enforcement that, in fact, uh, this person was posting things that could be of concern, specifically a threat against Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, who, as we all know, his office has indicted former President Trump. Well, in the filings is this little message right here, and apparently it comes uh, from True Social. There's actually something here that references truths which is true social way of saying post. And so we followed up on that today, and a senior law enforcement official told NBC News uh, that, in fact, it was true social is the unnamed company that gave him a, a tip-off that these posts were out there. We've reached out to the company for comment. We've yet to hear back. Uh, in addition to that, we also dug into the court records today. Myself and my colleague, Chloe Atkins, in the course of that work, uh, found out that he had a prior misdemeanor arrest in the late 90s, this uh, individual, uh, Craig Robertson, uh, Involving a, involving a misdemeanor count for disorderly conduct. So uh, that's something he pleaded no contest to and paid a fine. And we'll continue to follow this, of course, Aaron, as more details come up uh, in the coming days. Yeah, the investigation continues. Tom Winter for us tonight. Tom, thank you. Sure. Tonight, the FBI is stepping in to help investigate the assassination of an Ecuadorian presidential candidate. That's according to the country's current president, with the nation in a state of emergency less than two weeks now from a special election. This all happened yesterday in the capital city of Quito. You can see Fernando Villavicencio in the video here just moments before he was shot. He's leaving a campaign rally. The country's current president blaming the attack on organized crime. Now, that is something that Villavicencio had been known to speak out against. A part of his platform was promising to root out corruption and to lock up the country's thieves. Here he is at his rally the night he was killed talking about just that. This country is not lacking money. What this country has is extra thieves. That's the problem with this country. Now, authorities say one suspect in the attack is dead and that six others, all from Colombia, were detained. Guad Venegas joins me now. He's been looking into this. So, Guad, the country's president says there was a, a grenade that was also thrown into the street during the attack. What do we know about what all happened here and, and where the investigation and the election, for that matter, goes from here? Uh, Aaron, uh, the country's president offered a press conference last night where they shared some details as to what happened. So according to that information, uh, authorities responded, police officers who were there responded immediately, and uh, the suspects launched the grenade that uh, did not detonate. Uh, and then at some point, they detained these six suspects, and then a seventh suspect uh, was killed after a confrontation with police officers. We don't know more details than that. What we know is that the presidential candidate, Villavicencio, was killed. Uh, there was another candidate 
running for the legislature that was injured, as well as eight other individuals, including two police officers. Now, Aaron, we also know that just days ago, Villavicencio had appeared on television and said that he had received death threats, him and members of his staff, from someone he identified as Fito. Uh, Fito is uh, an individual that is believed to be the head of the Sinaloa cartel in Ecuador. Villavicencio said that Fito had threatened him uh, after he shared plans to create or build a new prison in Ecuador if he became president, where he would move all members of organized crime who are currently incarcerated in different parts of Ecuador. Just weeks ago, the country saw several riots inside a lot of those, a lot of those prisons where uh, police officers or guards were even taken hostage. So all of this is part of a wave of violence that, as the president has said, and also the U.S. ambassador, by the way, uh, could be the cause of uh, narco or organized criminals that exist in Ecuador. Again, the candidate saying, that just days before they had threatened his life, Aaron. Wow, so many layers to this story and so much more to learn about what all happened here and why. Guad Venegas for us in our Miami bureau. Guad, thank you. Coming up, scientists say they have invented the whitest paint ever and it could help you save big on air conditioning. We'll explain that for you in tonight's original. Plus, police are investigating after a boat crashed into a house in New York. A boat into a house. What we're learning about how this happened, that's later in the local. So now we want to bring you tonight's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. And tonight it's all about a really creative way that people could fight climate change using paint. You heard that right, paint. Imagine if you could cool down your home with paint. And if we think even bigger, what if you could cool down your entire neighborhood, your whole city? Well, researchers are trying to make that very thing happen. Our Maggie Vespa explains. Inside this engineering lab on Purdue University's flagship Indiana campus, researchers are cooking up something cool. A paint so white it bounces heat from the sun back into deep space. It could help cool surfaces, homes, potentially even entire cities, tempering the extreme heat that's become more common in our climate crisis. Emily Barber is a PhD student helping to create the paint. Just to be very clear, to a layman, these might look identical. Which one has your paint on it? So this is going to be our paint. I do just want to point out the artistic detail <laughs> yeah. here. It's lovely. It's very this lifelike. Is, uh, this is Jack. So what we're doing here is we're going to take this IR thermometer and we're going to use it to tell the temperature of the commercial roof versus our paint. Okay. And so right first we're going to point it at the commercial roof here. We can see that the temperature of the roof is around 89 degrees. And then the temperature of our roof, if we point it there, is going to be around 74 degrees. 74 compared to 89? Yes, so we already see a difference around 15 degrees. The difference can be felt inside these model homes as well. Those painted that bright white are cooler, which could also reduce homeowners' energy costs, researchers say, anywhere from 10 to 40 percent. We can see how much potential air conditioning they can save. Um, and we see uh, here we see around a four degree Fahrenheit difference. Clearly Jack is happier in this house. I think so, yeah. I think he's panting a little bit less. We wanted to save energy at the beginning and uh, help homeowners to cut their cooling bills. Professor Ruan leads the research. We're able to achieve the best performance that can reflect as much as 98.1% of sunlight. 98.1% sunlight. Percent sunlight, yes. That groundbreaking reflection, the result of creating super white pigment with components like barium sulfate, also used in the production of cosmetics and photo paper. It reflects rays from the sun like UV, which the eye can't see, instead of absorbing them. After almost a decade of manipulating the shapes of molecules and formulas, the Purdue team believes its work watching paint dry has produced extraordinary potential to counter rising temperatures. Specifically, it's hoping to help in so-called concrete jungles, where in America, 80% of the population lives. Temperatures are boosted by 8 degrees or more in a number of cities known as urban heat islands. Ruan's pitch? Paint the cities white. At least in part. They can be scattered at the different locations, like uh, roofs, um, uh, other infrastructures, um, uh, road curb size. Think the iconic white villas in Greece, balconies in Barcelona. This could bring things to the next level. Are we talking all white cities, all white neighborhoods? We don't need to paint the entire city white. The priority is to deploy these to the hottest 
and dry climate zones. The research earning the team wide ranging recognition, including from the Guinness Book of World Records, which in its 2022 edition dubbed this the whitest paint ever created. Came as a surprise. We never expected that. Ruan's team floored by the white hot spotlight, but determined not to lose focus in a race against time to combat a man made crisis. Maggie Vespa joins me now. So, Maggie, a couple of things here. Do we know when the paint might actually go on the market for people to buy? And is there really any, you know, no downside to, to just bouncing heat back into space? Yeah, that's interesting, Aaron. So basically, Professor Ruan says in short, no, he doesn't think that there is a downside to bouncing heat back into space, or at least there's no evidence that there is one. He does acknowledge that's slightly outside of his research realm, but he hasn't seen any evidence to indicate that that would harm us in any way. As far as how far out it is from being kind of available in a mass marketplace, at least a year at this point, Professor Ruan and his team, who you saw in that piece, say that they're in talks with a company to mass produce and mass market it. They couldn't say which one at this point. They want to protect that potential deal. But in the meantime, he says, you know, the goal is to cap carbon emissions, sure. But things like this, other solutions like this, he says, give him a lot more peace of mind. Aaron. Yeah. A year is not really that long. Sounds good. Maggie Vespa it's for not. us tonight. Thank, thank you, Maggie. Well, NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to all of them, our bureau teams have done it for you. We call this segment The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, one person is dead, a second hurt after a boat slammed into a house this morning. This was on New York's Fire Island. Nobody was home at the time. Police are trying to figure out how the power boat flew out of the water. Speed is being looked at as a factor. From our Midwest Bureau, Kentucky's largest school district shut down today. It'll be closed again tomorrow because of major transportation problems. A lack of bus drivers and route changes caused chaos during yesterday's first day of school. Some kids didn't get home until 10 o'clock at night. Routes will be reviewed over the next several days, and bus drivers will even practice those routes. And out of our Western Bureau, a scary scene in Utah. Look at this. A bull escaped during a rodeo. It actually hurt the lieutenant governor's family. You can see that bull launch a rider off its back here, too. Nobody was able to get control of this animal, and it ran right through the broken gate there. The bull charged at the lieutenant governor's mother and brother in the parking lot. They are both expected to be okay. Wow. Well, still to come, after a historic space flight today, Virgin Galactic is revealing some new details about future missions. That's coming up next. Well, tonight, the three passengers aboard Virgin Galactic's historic first space tourism flight are back on Earth. We can show you some of the flight they took, lasting about 90 minutes here, traveling about 55 miles up taking them right to the edge of space. Here they are now during the few minutes of weightlessness they experienced. Pretty cool. They are the first private paying tourist to fly on a Virgin Galactic space flight. A British former Olympian who bought a $200,000 ticket 18 years ago. And also a mother and daughter from the Caribbean who won seats through a fundraising lottery. Now the flight called Galactic 02 launched from Spaceport America in New Mexico. Tom Costello joins me now. Pretty cool to see this happening. Tom, what do we know about uh, what this experience was like for these passengers? Normal civilians here, no trained astronauts or military personnel, right? Yeah. And listen, I think it's important to call them space tourists, as you did, not astronauts. You know, listen, they had three days of training and they spent about three minutes or so weightless. Nonetheless, it was, uh, I think, for, they all described this as being kind of one of those moments in your life that changes you rather profoundly. So you mentioned that there was a mother and daughter on board from the Caribbean. They are Keisha Schaaf and her daughter, Anastasia Mayers. And after the flight, Anastasia, who's 18 years old and a university student uh, in Scotland, she talked about the experience and what it meant. I was shocked at the things that you feel. You are so much more connected to everything than you would expect to be. Like, you felt like a part of the team, a part of the ship, a part of the universe, a part of Earth. It was incredible, and I'm still starstruck. <laughs> Yeah, I think they had a good time. As you know, they are not the the first ever private citizens to go into space. We've had so many of them over the years. But this was an important mission for Virgin Galactic because it was Virgin Galactic's 
first ever all civilian passenger list, and they needed a success under the belt at Virgin Galactic. So given that, if they're calling this a success, Tom, uh, if, if it continues to go well, Richard, Bran Richard Branson's company is going to be offering monthly trips to customers on these winged space planes, if you will, as I understand it. Yeah. It's still really expensive to go to space to get people there. How soon can we expect uh, more customers to be a reality? How accessible will it be? Well, listen, they've got 800 people on the waiting list already. 800. Uh, uh, but you're right. It ain't cheap, right? Uh, it now costs $450,000. When they were first taking reservations, as you heard, that, that older gentleman, the 80-year-old former uh, Olympic canoeist, John Goodwin, he literally paid 200 grand. So now it's gone to 450 grand. This has really been described as one of those luxury life events. If you can afford it, if you want one of those fantastic luxury events that some people can afford in life, then maybe it's worth it. But they're not the only ones offering these trips, of course. You can do it also on SpaceX. Costs a lot of money. On Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin, again, costs a lot of money. Uh, but they offer a different experience. Uh, this was really, literally, uh, three minutes or so floating weightless right at the edge of space, Aaron. All right. Tom Costello for us. Tom, thank you. Appreciate it. That is a wrap for this hour. A new hour of coverage begins right now. The search is on as we're coming on the air for any survivors in Hawaii. Dozens of people are dead from the wildfires that have decimated the historic cities in Maui. Gone is the green, only gray and ash now. We are reporting live on the island and we'll hear from a surf instructor who helped save people from the fire. Also breaking tonight, five Americans stuck for years in an Iranian prison may have finally may finally have a path back home. The details we're getting from Washington and Tehran about a proposed swap. Then, just in from the Supreme Court, the justices pausing a deal that would protect the family behind drug maker Purdue Pharma from being sued for opioid-related claims. Why the Biden administration pushed for that hold. Plus, our investigation unit just now learning that former President Trump's social media company gave a tip that led to a deadly FBI raid on a man who threatened President Biden and other Democrats. What we're learning tonight from the court documents. And the alarm is sounding over at Disney with sharp price hikes for streaming services and the new crackdown on passwords. Why Wall Street is struggling to read these moves. That's later in the show. Hey, everybody. I'm Aaron Gilchrist in for Halley tonight. We come on the air tonight with a race against time. Officials surveying the damage on Maui as wildfires are destroying basically everything in their path. We're just finding out they're now 80 percent contained. That's good news. At least 36 people are dead across the island, and that number could go up. Look at this. This is a scene that's something like a war zone to some folks. Nothing but burned cars and concrete beams of what once were houses, as far as the eye can see here. And we want to show you some satellite images from just over two weeks ago of Lahaina's main area. It was once the capital of the Kingdom of Hawaii. Now let me show you what it looks like now. Gray, burned to the ground. No boats in the harbor there. The loss for many there goes deeper than material things, though. I want you to hear from one man who lost his father's ashes to the flames. That's the one thing I wanted to hold on to forever. And now he's just in the ground with all the other ashes. And that one's probably the toughest. About 1,000 people are spending the night in shelters there. More than 11,000 have already left the island. The airport there, it's packed with people trying to get away. Some airlines are offering cheap flights to other islands, while other airlines are flying in empty planes to get people out. We're also getting a first look at how they're fighting this fire. National Guard helicopters picking up water from what looks like a reservoir, and then they dump it over these fires, trying to put those flames out. These two planes emptied almost 60 buckets in five hours. That's more than 100,000 gallons of water. We have meteorologist Michelle Grossman on how the weather is impacting the fires. And we'll have a local business owner joining us in just a moment here. First, though, let's get to Dana Griffin, who's on the ground for us in Maui tonight. Uh, Dana, give us a sense of what it's been like there, right in the thick of things. I know there's a lot we don't know, but what are you hearing? Yeah, well, Aaron, the latest is that the fire has been 80% contained. That's according to fire officials who this morning got up, went and assessed the area. They continued the search and rescue 
part of their mission. So that's very good news considering that the efforts were hampered earlier in this firefight because of the wind, the gusty wind. And we're actually feeling a lot more gust today, but hopefully it's not fanning those flames and it is going to help settle as they try to finish this. We are outside of the largest shelter, evacuation shelter in Maui. We have seen hundreds of people coming and going. They're getting food, water, clothing, and we're talking to people about their harrowing tales of survival, including an elderly couple that had to walk 15 miles, Aaron, to safety. Listen to part of our interview just moments ago. We came off the street and got housing. That was the housing we had. And so now, back on the street. So that's tough at our age. The we feeling had, of security. We on the street, so we didn't have much to begin So with. it was the feeling of security. And Aaron, that couple found out this morning from a neighbor that their home has been destroyed. It's just so tough to think about what these folks are having to go through. Uh, we know that President Biden talked about this uh, at an event today, uh, an event that's not related, obviously, to what's been going on there. But I do want to play some of what he had to say. Our prayers with the people of Hawaii, but not just our prayers. Every asset we have will be available to them. And we've seen they've seen their homes, their business destroyed and some have lost loved ones, and it's not over yet. So we've talked about these active teams that are trying to get this fire under control. What happens next here? What's the next step in this process, Dana? Well, the most important step is to make sure this fire is 100% contained, allowing residents time to go in, assess the damage. They're going to have FEMA come out, also take a look and, tr and try to house people that have lost everything, temporary housing, possible grants so that they can reestablish themselves and their businesses. And Aaron, this is a, a feat that's going to cost at least a billion dollars. That's the estimate that we're hearing from officials. And it will take years to rebuild that historic town of Lahaina which many estimate will never return to its full glory. Aaron. All right, Dana Griffin for us on Maui tonight. Dana, thank you. I want to bring in Lisa Panis now uh, in Maui, also uh, joining us live now. Uh, we appreciate you making some time. Obviously, this has been uh, a really tough time for you. I, I know we showed some images a little while ago, some satellite images of uh, areas that have just been destroyed uh, around Lahaina, where I know you were born and raised. Um, yeah. What do you make of this? How are you feeling? What are you, what are you thinking and what are you seeing right now? Well, my heart hurts for my people. Um, everybody in Lahaina has always been so strong. Like, um, I know I'm not the only person that ran into a burning building. Um, I ran in with um, surf short slippers, tank top, I decided to stay behind and hide while we were being evacuated to help out others. And uh, me and my partner, Daniel, um, Kelo, Keko Nui, um, Hopi, he helped me out. Um, we tried to run back into the fire, save as much people as we can. But what we really do need is support. Like a lot of people, we all lost our homes, especially like or just everybody, you know, people lost their lives. I'm not really one that wants to be recognized. I was married to a firefighter for over 10 years. I've worked alongside Ina, Ina Kohler, Kohler, Ina Kohler, she was also a firefighter. She was um, one of my, surf, um, she was, she's an owner of a surf school. I mean, we survived Hurricane Lane. I didn't know that it, this was gonna be that bad. But, yeah. you know, we're all we're all persevering. We're all trying. But I would like to recognize also um, Uncle Rusty Allen Irwin, because he is a veteran firefighter for over 40 years with wildland fires from Oregon. And when we saw the fire, we, um, he did he did tell the some of the fire departments that the fire wasn't contained because he's a specialist in wildland fires. 20 minutes later, it kicked up. I asked my uncle because I trust him, and um, she, she's like, "This is going to be bad." So, 20 minutes this, later, me... everybody had to evacuate. I stayed back, but what we need is uh, we need support. We need um, any kind of funding, anyone to help out the Lahaina people, not just Lahaina. We have fires blowing out in Kihei and in Kula, 
And, um, and There's so I wanna, many communities I on the island there. I know. I, I do want to ask you, you, you mentioned that, that you, you said you ran back in, uh, back into the fire. Help me understand what was going on. You ran back into where and for what reason? It was, it was my cousin's house on fire. At first wow. it was a wildland fire and then we were all trying to go put gas and then I saw my cousin's house ablaze. So, I mean, you know, firefighting, it, it's, it is a big risky job, but you don't need brains to run into a fire to try and save someone's life. So I ran in slippers, surf shorts, and a bathing suit top, got eyewitnesses. I ran in, no one was there, got out. And then a few of my friends, we stayed back when they were trying to push us all out. We saved some people from the water. We saved two kids from a burning building. Wow. Well, I know that uh, your community has got to be so grateful for what you and your friends and, and others have done to try to help out. And there are so many other people yeah. who are looking for ways well, to help out. Lisa, we appreciate yeah. you uh, making yeah. some time for but us I, tonight. I, and we... um, if, if I can, I would like to say this. I'm not the only one. Yeah. Maui, we have a very strong community. Lahaina has always been super dedicated to helping everybody and its people. But if anyone can just donate anything, because the families here, we are in need. A lot of us have, nothing. we have, we have not cakeys, you know, we have little ones. Yeah. We got kapunas that need help. Any kind of aid for the whole Maui or anyone that's on fire right now, because the yeah. fire is still a blaze. We still got fires in Kihei and in Kula. I just pray for my people, hope that we all stand strong and we, we will prosper. Absolutely. We're, we're sending prayers your way, and I know people have heard that call for help uh, across the country now. So, Lisa, uh, our, our thoughts are with you, and, uh, and we wish you the best. Thank you guys so much. Let's uh, turn to meteorologist Michelle Grossman now to get an understanding of how weather plays into all this. Michelle, how is it contributing to the fires? When are things going to get better from that perspective? All right. Hi there, Aaron. Well, things are already starting to get better weather-wise. We're looking at winds starting to decrease. We're seeing some gusty winds. We saw that in Dana's shot where we're looking at winds gusting up to 25 miles per hour, but better than the 40 miles per hour earlier this morning, better than the 70, 80 miles per hour that we saw yesterday. So what happened yesterday was sort of a perfect storm, so to speak. We had an area of high pressure, a big area of high pressure to the north. That came off the west, so it brought some dry air with it. We also had a major hurricane, Category 4 hurricane, 200 miles south of the islands. These two interacted a very strong pressure gradient that created that wind tunnel over the islands, right over the islands. Not a lot of friction slowing these winds down uh, over the water. And then also they're in a drought. So we're looking at an ongoing drought, really dry vegetation, grass, trees. That is fuel for any fires and relative humidity. We are looking at very low humidity. That's going to continue. So as we go throughout the next 24 hours, we're still seeing a uh, door down to the south, but it's starting to move off to the west with the area of high pressure. That will start to decrease the winds. And Aaron, good news, we're going to see winds decreasing to about 10 miles per hour by midnight tonight. Back to you. All right. Glad to hear that. Michelle Grossman. Thank you, Michelle. Sure. Some more breaking news now with Iran's deputy foreign minister saying Iranian assets are in the process of being released as part of a prisoner swap for five detained Americans. Now, earlier today, sources with knowledge of the matter told us it's one step in a deal between Washington and Tehran for these three Americans and two others who have not been publicly identified. The National Security Council saying in a statement that negotiations are ongoing and delicate. Now, under the proposed deal, as we understand it, the Iranian government would get access to some $6 billion blocked by U.S. sanctions in exchange for the prisoners. Iran would be able to use that money only for food, medicine, and other humanitarian purposes. Dan DeLuce is joining me now with the latest on this. So, Dan, we know back in March, Iran's top diplomat said a prisoner swap deal was close. That was in March. The U.S. immediately called it a cruel lie. So what's your understanding of, of what's changed now, and, and what's the meaning of uh, assets are in the process of being released? Well, this is the beginning of a long, uh, tricky process here, Aaron. And the first point uh, is that uh, we don't know why the deal didn't come together uh, previously, right? These negotiations had been off and on for months. It may be that there was traction or progress in other areas unrelated to the fate of these Americans. But what is true is that President Biden has now made a, a major decision knowing full well that he's going to get heavily criticized from Republican lawmakers here in Washington about uh, giving Iran access to this money. But you have Anthony Blinken, uh, just now the Secretary of State, uh, defending the decision, saying, you know, this is Iranian money, uh, it belongs to Iran, and it's merely being transferred uh, to Qatar, and they will only be able to use it to purchase 
food or other humanitarian type items. So already kind of a debate emerging uh, on this decision. All right, Dan DeLuce for us today. Dan, we appreciate the reporting. Thank you. Let's get you to some more breaking news now. Just into us in the last couple of hours, the Supreme Court putting the bankruptcy reorganization of Purdue Pharma, the maker of OxyContin, on hold. That's after the Biden administration objected to a part of this deal that protected the Sackler family that controls the company from liability. Now, the family had agreed to pay $6 billion toward opioid-related lawsuits, but only as long as they were shielded from any future cases against the company. Now, we've talked about it on this show. OxyContin is the powerful painkiller that was marketed aggressively by Purdue, arguing it was not addictive. The opioid crisis that followed has killed tens of thousands a year over the last decade. NBC's Lawrence Hurley covers the Supreme Court and joins us now. So, Lawrence, uh, where does this case go from here, right? What, what are the implications, too, for the Sackler family? So, for right now, this, this decision by the Supreme Court, which is just a preliminary decision, uh, puts everything on hold, which means the deal won't go into effect. Uh, the bankruptcy is not settled. Uh, and the Supreme Court is going to hear arguments in December and then issue a ruling sometime next year, probably early next year, uh, that will provide some certainty on what's going to happen. And so in the meantime, um, everything's sort of up in the air with this agreement. Uh, the company itself uh, has kind of criticized this case. Uh, the fact that the U.S. bankruptcy trustee who brought this appeal, uh, who's objecting to the settlement, um, is actually holding up distribution of funds that would have gone to victims of the opioid epidemic as the company seeks to kind of reorganize itself. So um, that is now not going to happen in the meantime. But of course, once the Supreme Court ruling happens, then we'll see how this plays out. All right. Much more to come on this. Lawrence Hurley with us tonight. Lawrence, we appreciate it. Thanks. We are learning just in the last couple of hours that prosecutors want to ring in the new year by starting former President Donald Trump's trial here in D.C. January 2nd is their proposed date for a jury to start hearing the case alleging Trump tried to uh, overturn the legitimate 2020 election based on lies about fraud. The government says a trial could take something like four to six weeks, and that's where things are going to get a little tricky for the former president because mid-January is when the early states start to vote. So if he's in court, that means he cannot be on the campaign trail for the Iowa caucuses, for example, on January 15th. Ryan Riley joins me now to talk a little bit more about what's uh, been happening here. And so, Ryan, Trump's team has until next week to respond to this January 2nd idea. Would conventional wisdom tell us that they're going to do whatever they can to not make January 2nd the start date? Yeah, they're really going to try to kick the can down the road here. And I think they want, I mean, this is essentially, the election is the substitute for the trial, I think, for the Trump team. Mm. They essentially want to move this as far down as they possibly can. So I think that this is an opening sort of entry from uh, the uh, special counsel's office, but it might not be what the, uh, what the judge actually settles on. I think this is potentially something that you may see, okay, give them a couple more months mm. down the road. But, you know, they want to get this done, I think, as soon as possible. And they did have a test case with this, with the Proud Boys case, because what what they're suggesting here is that they actually say, hey, right before the holidays, let's set the jury, let's get that all set, and then right when you come back, we'll do that. And that's what they did in the Proud Boys case last year, and it worked out okay for them, getting that jury set, seated in December and then being ready to go, actually, when the new year starts. So I want to ask you sort of about the bigger picture here, right? I mean, if we talk about Florida, we just got some of the images from uh, the courtroom from there today. This is the, the classified documents case, some sketches that have come in. You can see here Trump's two co uh, alleged co-conspirators here, Walt Nada, who pleaded not guilty, and Carlos de la Vera, who uh, couldn't enter a, a plea because he doesn't have a local lawyer there in Florida. And that means another delay in these hearings for this particular case. This idea of delays, is there a, a sense that a, a delay strategy is really coming together here across the board? Yeah, I mean, with that case, because of those multiple defendants and because, frankly, they have a pretty sympathetic judge, you're probably going to see that get kicked down even further because mm -hmm. it's just a matter of having those many defendants, having the classified information um, is really going to cause a delay. I think what they've done, is that, especially in the uh, election interference case, is the special counsel has learned a lot of lessons yeah. from what happened there. They've also just drawn a better judge, but they also, um, you can say basically, hey, this is a really simple case. It's only really this one defendant. We're not going to complicate it. We're not going to charge all these alleged co-conspirators at the same time. We're going to keep this simple and as a, on a quick of a track as we possibly can. All right. We'll see how it all shakes out. Uh, Ryan Riley, we appreciate it. Thanks. Well, in just the last half hour, we're learning the former, uh, we're hearing from a senior law enforcement official that the man killed in an FBI raid after threatening President Biden pointed his weapon at agents. 
Now, this source telling our White House team that the man did not respond to the FBI's command before he was shot and killed. It all played out in an early morning raid just hours before President Biden's visit to that state. You're seeing the first video we have of that raid now. Remember, this man allegedly posted a lot of threats against the president and other Democrats. And we're also learning former President Trump's social media company, Truth Social, actually flagged those posts to the FBI. Tom Winter joins me now. Tom, uh, talk us through what we know about this Truth Social involvement now. And, and, and I understand there's some new details about the suspect's arrest history, too. That's right, Aaron. So you remember last night when we were speaking about this uh, this incident shortly after it happened, we talked about the fact that a social media company had tipped off federal law enforcement that, in fact, uh, this person was posting things that could be of concern, specifically a threat against Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, who, as we all know, his office has indicted former President Trump. Well, in the filings is this little message right here, and apparently it comes uh, from True Social. There's actually something here that references truths which is true social way of saying post. And so we followed up on that today, and a senior law enforcement official told NBC News uh, that, in fact, it was true social is the unnamed company that gave him a, a tip off that these posts were out there. We've reached out to the company for comment. We've yet to hear back. Uh, in addition to that, we also dug into the court records today. Myself and my colleague, Chloe Atkins, in the course of that work, uh, found out that he had a prior misdemeanor arrest in the late 90s. This uh, individual, uh, Craig Robertson, uh, Involving a, involving a misdemeanor count for disorderly conduct. So uh, that's something he pleaded no contest to and paid a fine. And we'll continue to follow this, of course, Aaron, as more details come up uh, in the coming days. Yeah, the investigation continues. Tom Winter for us tonight. Tom, thank you. Sure. Michigan's case against suspected fake 2020 electors moving forward tonight now that all 16 defendants have pleaded not guilty. They're accused of trying to illegally forge documents stating that Donald Trump won Michigan's 16 electoral college votes when they actually went to Joe Biden. Now, the state alleges the defendants, including current and former Republican and elected officials, signed their names to certificates claiming they were the legitimate members of the electoral college. They even showed up to try to deliver some of those certificates. You can see them here outside the state capitol. This is in December 2020. All of this ties into the charges we saw filed against former President Trump last week. The Justice Department accusing him of pushing the fake elector scheme in several states, including Michigan. NBC's Shaquille Brewster outside the courthouse in Lansing, Michigan for us tonight. So, Shaq, uh, all of these defendants pleading not guilty, they were literally seen, as we showed people a second ago on camera, being denied entry into the Michigan State right. Capitol back in 2020. What's your understanding of what sort of defense they're going to be putting together here? Well, it's going to be a lot of pushback. You're already hearing some of that in the form of going after the attorney general, saying that this was a political prosecution, asking why it took so long for these charges to come about. But you're also seeing them go after the merits of the case. Let's go through those charges first, because they're facing eight felony charges, all 16 of those suspected uh, fake electors. Three of those charges related to forgery for making a false document. Three of those charges connected to uttering and publishing, essentially presenting that false document, that el election certificate, as legitimate and then two of them forgery collect connected to election law. You're hearing a lot of defenses out there. I want you to hear from uh, my conversations with two attorneys for two different defendants and listen to some of the similarities and differences in how they're presenting their defense. They were trying to preserve, it appears, these individuals, an objection, and then have that objection ruled upon by the, uh, by the vice president of the United States. If the outcome of that challenge was that the challenge failed, then his elector signature would never be used. That was his understanding. That's what he was told. Therefore, there is no crime here. That last attorney who you just heard from actually told me that he believes his client didn't even see the election certificate and didn't see the text on it, which is the basis of the counts against him. He said that his client was presented with a blank, uh, with, with the signature page, and he just affixed his signature and essentially kept it moving. That will all be part of the process that you'll continue to see in the days and weeks and months to come as this case, as these cases make their way through the court. Aaron? Yeah, a lot to watch there in Michigan. Shaq Brewster for us tonight. Thank you, Shaq.
Well, a Kremlin source today telling NBC News that Russian President Vladimir Putin is weighing whether to go to next month's G20 summit in India. Now, it would be Putin's first face-to-face -face meeting with Western leaders since Russia invaded Ukraine almost 18 months ago. Now, this is a high-stakes decision setting up a potentially tense situation and a really a risk of humiliation on a global stage, with Western leaders opposed to the Russian invasion, of course. And then there are the questions that he might have to deal with from foreign journalists. Our chief international correspondent, Keir Simmons, broke this story for NBC News. He's joining me now. Uh, Keir, walk us through this. What's at stake here for Vladimir Putin, and, and what do we know about his considerations in making this decision? Well, I think he would like to be back on the world stage, obviously. Plainly, there are many, many who would not like to see that, in particular Western leaders, President Biden, uh, for example. And I think there's no chance, of course, for example, at a G20 of seeing President Biden agree to a, a photo call alongside President Putin. So at the risk for President Putin, uh, ex experts in Russia tell us, is, of course, that he effectively gets humiliated, as you suggest. But then the advantage is could be that there are leaders going who have not been so opposed to President Putin, uh, the leader of Saudi, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, for example, uh, South Africa, uh, India itself, uh, China. Uh, none of those countries voted in favour of a, a UN resolution condemning uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, this year. Each of them abstained. Would it be possible for the Indian government to arrange a way for President Putin to come and meet with those leaders and be seen to be there and not have to face uh, the Western leaders in a room together with those them or face questions from Western journalists. But I think that's the kind of issue that's being sized up, if you like. I think in the end, it's unlikely that President Putin will decide to go, more likely that he'll do what he's done on a number of occasions so far and, and, and appear at a G20 uh, by, uh, by visuals, by, by video. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, he's nine months away from an election. And I suspect that he will be thinking about that, too, and, and whether there's an opportunity uh, to kind of inch back, if you like, into, onto the world stage. You know, we thought back to 2014 when the G20 was in Australia. This was after Russia annexed Crimea. Uh, so you had sort of similar circumstances. And we have this photo, Putin really sidelined, almost literally here, uh, in this photo of world leaders. Does Russia have any way of, of really still having a, a relevant, a welcoming seat at any world table at this point? Even if by video, would, would Putin still have to deal with some level of being shunned? Well, you know, it's interesting that you point out 2014 there, Aaron, because remember that, you know, a lot happened after that, before the full-scale invasion of, of Ukraine, and, and Putin found his way back into, you know, diplomatic circles, if you like, on, onto that world stage. Uh, I remember back in 2018, uh, he high-fived with Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, just a month or so after Jamal Khashoggi was, was killed. So he, President Putin believes that that time could be on his side. It does look as if uh, Ukraine's counteroffensive is not producing the results that Ukraine and the West would have wanted. And so uh, the conflict there in Ukraine is likely to continue for some time, for the foreseeable future. How will that change the world's view? Nothing ever stays the same forever. Now, clearly, President Putin has done his political reputation around the world an awful lot of damage, uh, but he has experience of seeing things shift if you just wait. All right, Keir Simmons for us tonight. We appreciate the reporting, Keir. Thank you. Well, still ahead this hour, the show will eventually go on. The new plans for the Emmy Awards as the Hollywood labor fights drag on. Plus, new betting allegations against golf great Phil Mickelson, the claims about the staggering amount he wagered. That's next. More bans on Barbie. We'll explain why the film is facing another ban later in the global. First, though, tonight kicks off one of the biggest political events of the year. No, it's not a debate or a town hall. We're talking about the Iowa State Fair in Des Moines, typically the largest gathering of candidates in the state ahead of its first in the nation caucuses. The fair gives Iowans a chance to size up politicians up close, how they embrace the traditions of butter sculptures and every fried food imaginable. Over roughly two weeks, Iowans will see virtually every major candidate descend on the fairgrounds, a rare sight 
since candidates typically spread out among the early primary states. NBC's Dasha Burns is in Des Moines for us. Aaron, look, if you are running for president, coming to the Iowa State Fair is pretty much mandatory. This is where voters check to see if you're the real deal by eating all of the fried food you could possibly eat. I mean, just right here, you got your corn dogs, you got your root beer, cotton candy, fried cheese curds. I myself have already partaken in a little bit of a fried Oreo fest. Uh, but look, as much as this is the land of opportunity, it's where candidates can show voters that they are able to connect. It's also full of landmines. Look, are you underdressed, overdressed? Are you eating the right fried food? Are you shaking the right hands? Are you are you making sure that you're being authentic? Because that's what Iowa voters are really looking for. And when I talk to the voters here, look, the reality is a lot of them are still very much open-minded and undecided about who they are planning to caucus for. So I asked them, what do they want to see in a candidate? What is going to win them over? Take a listen. I want them to say what they're going to do to help us. I don't care what anybody else has done or past presidents or current president. I just want to, you know, what are you going to do? Ones that are really actually going to follow through on their promises to help the community. They, always, they make a lot of promises and then they never follow through. Iowa is always important, but its importance cannot be overstated in this cycle because of the Trump factor. Look, if Trump wins Iowa, it is basically over. But if another candidate can come close or can win here, then the door starts to open. And while Trump is leading here, he's not leading by as big a margin in Iowa as he is nationally and his support here is softer and what does that mean it means that the voters that say they support him right now say they are still willing to consider other candidates to listen to what others have to say over the next five months which in political time is as like dog years it's a lot of time uh, before those january caucuses so there is an opportunity for others to win over these critical critical voters here aaron Dasha Burns in Iowa for us tonight. Let's get you to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, a teenager has been indicted on hate crime charges in the murder of a New York City man. O'Shea Sibley, who was gay, was stabbed to death last month while dancing at a gas station. Witnesses say a group hurled homophobic slurs at Sibley and his friends moments before the killing. A 17-year-old is in custody for that crime. That person's name has not been released. Number two, about one in three U.S. hospitals has been forced to ration life-saving drugs because of a major medication shortage. That's according to a new survey. The other two-thirds say they haven't been as severely impacted by shortages, but they have had to change the way they treat some patients. The survey showed that hospitals are running low on things like chemo medication, antibiotics, ADHD meds, and opioids. Number three, the video game streamer who sparked chaos in New York City last week says the riot was, quote, not his intention. Kai Sinat used social media to call people to Union Square Park. They were all hoping to get a free PlayStation, a PlayStation 5. The stunt led to crowded streets, smashed cars, dozens of arrests. Sinat says the giveaway was supposed to be fun. He's now facing several charges. Number four, a new book is alleging that golf champion Phil Mickelson has gambled more than a billion dollars over the past 30 years. The author, a well-known gambler named Billy Walters, says Mickelson even wanted to place a $400,000 bet on the 2012 Ryder Cup tournament, which he was playing in. Mickelson's management group did not immediately respond to a request, to a request for comment from the AP. Number five, the 75th Emmy Awards has a new date. The TV awards show normally held in September, but Fox says it's now been pushed to January 15th because of the Hollywood writers and actors strikes. Coming up, paint that may be good for your wallet. The science behind what's called the world's whitest paint. That's in our original. First, though, unraveling a tragedy in Ecuador, a presidential candidate assassinated there. What we know about the suspects in custody and where they're from. Tonight, Ecuador's president says the FBI is stepping in to help investigate the, the assassination of an Ecuadorian presidential candidate. This happened yesterday in the capital city of Quito. You can see Fernando Villavicencio in the video here just moments before he was shot, leaving a campaign rally. 
Now, the country is in a state of emergency less than two weeks away from a special election. The country's current president blaming the attack on organized crime. That is something Villavicencio had been known to speak out against. A big part of his platform was promising to root out corruption and to lock up the country's thieves. Here he is at a rally the night he was killed talking about just that. This country is not lacking money. What this country has is extra thieves. That's the problem with this country. Authorities say one suspect in the attack is dead and that six others, all from Colombia, were detained. Guad Venegas joins us now. Uh, he's been looking into this throughout the day. So, Guad, I know that just days before this happened, Villavicencio had been saying that he was getting death threats from a cartel leader. What have you been able to piece together about the circumstances around this attack? Aaron, in fact, he said that on camera. He mentioned the leader, the man believed to be the leader of the Sinaloa cartel in Ecuador. This is a man known as Fito, who is currently incarcerated. Now, just days before, two weeks before exactly, there were prison riots in Ecuador uh, with people left dead and even prison guards who were taken hostage. That's when the government decided to declare a state of emergency. We also saw uh, a mayor, the mayor of the town of Manta, uh, get assassinated also two weeks ago. So after that violence, uh, this presidential candidate said he was threatened. Uh, him and members of his staff by the leader or the believed, the man believed to be the leader of the Sinaloa cartel. That's the information we have. Of course, government authorities are now reacting. Here's the president speaking of what uh, they're doing now. The armed forces from this moment forward are mobilized throughout the entire national territory to ensure the safety of citizens, the tranquility of the country, and the free and democratic elections of August 20th. Y las elecciones libres y democráticas. So that was the president speaking last night, reacting. Uh, what we know from the incident itself is that this attack happened after an event. Uh, we know that the candidate uh, was shot, and there was another candidate running for the uh, country's legislature that was also injured. We know that eight other individuals were injured, including two police officers. At some point, officers who were there reacted, and they confronted some of the suspects. Six of them are now detained. There was another suspect that uh, police referred to as a sicario who died in exchange with police. That's the information that we have. And now that the president has indicated that the FBI will be sending a team of investigators to help, uh, we think that this investigation could be different from any other investigation we've seen in Ecuador as a result of the violence. Uh, the president saying that the FBI will be arriving in the next few hours, Aaron. And hopefully we'll get more information after that. Guad Venegas for us in our Miami bureau. Guad, thank you. Now, NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. We call this segment The Global. Out of Uganda, the president there criticizing the World Bank's decision to suspend new funding there in response to the country's new anti-LGBTQ law. The World Bank says that law, which imposes the death penalty for certain same-sex acts, contradicts its values. Uganda's president says he'll find other sources of funding. The World Bank's current projects in Uganda will not be affected. From Argentina, the death of a young girl is sparking major protests throughout the country. The 11-year-old died after being attacked by robbers on her way to school. The clash has come right before the national primary elections in Argentina this weekend. All of the major candidates canceled their closing campaign rallies. Much more ahead this hour, Disney hiking prices on its streaming services for the second time in about a year, and a crackdown on password sharing could be coming. We'll tell you what that means for you when we come back. Well, now we want to bring you tonight's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on for you. And tonight, it's all about a really creative way that people could fight climate change using paint. You heard that right, paint. Imagine if you could cool down your home with paint. Or you think bigger than that? What if you could cool down your entire neighborhood, your whole city? Well, researchers are trying to make that happen. Our Maggie Vespa explains. Inside this engineering lab on Purdue University's flagship Indiana campus, researchers are cooking up something cool. A paint so white it bounces heat from the sun back into deep space. It could help cool surfaces, homes, potentially even entire cities, tempering the extreme heat that's become more common in our climate crisis. Emily Barber is a PhD student helping to create the paint. Just to be very clear, 
to a layman, these might look identical. Which one has your paint on it? So this is gonna be our paint. I do just wanna point out the artistic detail <laughs> yeah. here. It's lovely, it's very this lifelike. Is, uh, this is Jack. So what we're doing here is we're gonna take this IR thermometer and we're going to use it to tell the temperature of the commercial roof versus our paint. Okay. And so right first, we're gonna point it at the commercial roof here. We can see that the temperature of the roof is around 89 degrees. And then the temperature of our roof, if we point it there, is going to be around 74 degrees. 74 compared to 89? Yes, so we already see a difference around 15 degrees. The difference can be felt inside these model homes as well. Those painted that bright white are cooler, which could also reduce homeowners' energy costs, researchers say, anywhere from 10 to 40 percent. We can see how much potential air conditioning they can save. Um, and we see a, here we see around a four degree Fahrenheit difference. Clearly Jack is happier in this house. I think so, yeah. I think he's panting a little bit less. We wanted to save energy at the beginning and uh, help homeowners to cut their cooling bills. Professor Ruan leads the research. We're able to achieve the best performance that can reflect as much as 98.1% of sunlight. 98.1% of sunlight. sunlight, yes. That groundbreaking reflection, the result of creating super white pigment with components like barium sulfate, also used in the production of cosmetics and photo paper. It reflects rays from the sun like UV, which the eye can't see, instead of absorbing them. After almost a decade of manipulating the shapes of molecules and formulas, the Purdue team believes its work watching paint dry has produced extraordinary potential to counter rising temperatures. Specifically, it's hoping to help in so-called concrete jungles, where in America, 80% of the population lives. Temperatures are boosted by 8 degrees or more in a number of cities known as urban heat islands. Ruan's pitch? Paint the cities white. At least in part. They can be scattered at the different locations, like at roofs, um, other infrastructures, um, road curbsides. Think the iconic white villas in Greece, balconies in Barcelona. This could bring things to the next level. Are we talking all white cities, all white neighborhoods? We don't need to paint the entire city white. The priority is to deploy these to the hottest and dry climate zones. The research earning the team wide ranging recognition, including from the Guinness Book of World Records, which in its 2022 edition dubbed this the whitest paint ever created. Came as a surprise. We never expected that. Ruan's team floored by the white hot spotlight, but determined not to lose focus in a race against time to combat a man made crisis. Maggie Vespa joins me now. So, Maggie, a couple of things here. Do we know when the paint might actually go on the market for people to buy? And is there really any, uh, you know, no downside to, to just bouncing heat back into space? Yeah, that's interesting, Aaron. So basically, Professor Ruan says in short, no, he doesn't think that there is a downside to bouncing heat back into space, or at least there's no evidence that there is one. He does acknowledge that's slightly outside of his research realm, but he hasn't seen any evidence to indicate that that would harm us in any way. As far as how far out it is from being kind of available at a mass marketplace, at least a year at this point, Professor Ruan and his team, who you saw in that piece, say that they're in talks with a company to mass produce and mass market it. They couldn't say which one at this point. They want to protect that potential deal. But in the meantime, he says, you know, the goal is to cap carbon emissions, sure. But things like this, other solutions like this, he says, give him a lot more peace of mind. Aaron. Yeah. A year is not really that long. Sounds good. Maggie Vespa for us tonight. Thank, thank you, Maggie. The era of cheap streaming may officially be over. That's as Disney Plus and Hulu are set to be the next streaming platforms to increase subscription rates and crack down on password sharing. Starting in October, an ad-free subscription for Disney Plus will go up $3 to 14 bucks a month. Ad-free Hulu is also going up $3 to $18 a month. But Disney is also adding a new bundle, both services, for 20 bucks. Now, the movie comes, the move comes as Disney CEO Bob Iger tries to turn the company around and make Disney Plus a profitable segment for the company. Disney Plus lost $512 million in the most recent quarter, bringing its total losses since 2019 to more than $11 billion. Andrew Freund is joining us now uh, to help us understand what's happening here. So, Andrew, Disney Plus isn't just losing money. It's also losing subscribers, we know, down more than 11 million from April through June. 
It's expected to have, uh, you know, very little new content in the pipeline. We have the writer's strike, the actor's strike going on. Is there thinking that Bob Iger can make back that money lost on streaming simply by raising prices? Yeah, you know, that's the thinking right now. And what I will say is Disney is offering um, a deal for consumers with that $19.99 a month bundle with Hulu. It's about a 37% discount if you were, you know, as opposed to stand the standalone products. But I will say you're right. With the writer's strike, the actor's strike, the content for next year in 2024, it's going to be very bleak, Aaron. Um, and also Disney reported that their content spend is going to be down a lot this year. It's going to be about $27 billion versus the forecasted $30 billion because they're saving money quite frankly, from this strike. So Bob Iger is really trying to turn this around. There's a lot of competition right now with the other streamers, with Netflix, you know, with, with Paramount Plus. And also what we're finding is because of the whole password um, sharing thing, the LA Times reported that Netflix, for example, lost around $12 billion. So we'll see what happens, Aaron. You can't help but to wonder what, what more of a direct impact there's going to be on consumers with all that's going on right now. Are we going to continue to see rising prices, more crackdowns on shared accounts, shared passwords, or will be the, there be somebody who tries to compete in a different way? You know, it's, it's, it's all of the above, and we're just kind of, it's a wait and see, because this whole streaming frontier is new. You know, compared to linear television, that's what the actors are fighting for, what the writers are fighting for. Now, the other thing, the big rumor right now, is that Disney is getting ready to sell to Apple. So there's really only one company that can afford Disney, and that is Apple. Mm. So Bob Iger, the ultimate deal maker, this could be the ultimate deal of all time. So, again, only time's going to tell, Aaron. Yeah, a lot to watch here in that space, uh, in this really relatively new space, for sure. Andrew, we appreciate your perspective. Thanks. Well, up next, to the final frontier, or at least the edge of it, and back inside Virgin Galactic's first tourist flight. Stay with us. Well, tonight, the three passengers on board Virgin Galactic's historic first flight for tourism, a space tourism flight. They're back on Earth. We can show you some of the uh, flight they took. Lasted about 90 minutes, traveling about 55 miles and taking them right to the edge of space. Here they are during the few minutes of weightlessness they experienced. They are the first private paying tourists to fly on a Virgin Galactic space flight. Tom Costello joins me now. Pretty cool to see this happening, Tom. What do we know about uh, what this experience was like for these passengers? Normal civilians here, no trained astronauts or military personnel, right? Yeah. And listen, I think it's important to call them space tourists, as you did, not astronauts. You know, listen, they had three days of training, and they spent about three minutes or so weightless. Nonetheless, it was, uh, I think, for they all described this as being kind of one of those moments in your life that changes you rather profoundly. So you mentioned that there was a mother and daughter on board from the Caribbean. They are Keisha Schaaf and her daughter, Anastasia Mayers. And after the flight, Anastasia, who's 18 years old and a university student uh, in Scotland, she talked about the experience and what it meant. I was shocked at the things that you feel. Mm -hmm. You are so much more connected to everything than you would expect to be. Like, you felt like a part of the team, a part of the ship, a part of the universe, a part of Earth. It was incredible, and I'm still starstruck. <laughs> Yeah, I think they had a good time. As you know, they are not the the first ever private citizens to go into space. We've had so many of them over the years. But this was an important mission for Virgin Galactic because it was Virgin Galactic's first ever all-civilian passenger list, and they needed a success under their belt at Virgin Galactic. So given that, if they're calling this a success, Tom, uh, if, if it continues to go well, Richard, Bran Richard Branson's company is going to be offering monthly trips to customers on these winged space planes, if you will, as I understand it. Yeah. It's still really expensive to go to space, to get people there. How soon can we expect uh, more customers to be a reality? How accessible will it be? Well, listen, they've got 800 people on the waiting list already. 800. 
Uh, but you're right, it ain't cheap, right? Uh, it now costs $450,000. When they were first taking reservations, as you heard, that, that older gentleman, the 80-year-old former uh, Olympic canoeist, John Goodwin, he literally paid 200 grand. So now it's gone to 450 grand. This has really been described as one of those luxury life events. If you can afford it, if you want one of those fantastic luxury events that some people can afford in life, then maybe it's worth it. But they're not the only ones offering these trips, of course. You can do it also on SpaceX. Costs a lot of money. On Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin, again, costs a lot of money. Uh, but they offer a different experience. Uh, this was really, literally, uh, three minutes or so floating weightless right at the edge of space, Aaron. All right. Tom Costello for us. Tom, thank you. Appreciate it. And that is a wrap this hour. I'm Aaron Gilchrist in for Hallie Jackson. We appreciate you watching. Hallie will be back here next week. I'll be back in the chair for you tomorrow night when we will bring you a preview of the NFL preseason. Also, if you missed any of it, you can catch up on the latest reporting and the newest interviews from our team. You can find us anytime in all the places you see on your screen right there. Uh, Xfinity, Peacock, Roku, Pluto TV, Tubu, tu tu <laughs> Tubu? There might be something called Tubu out there. b is definitely out there. Hulu, uh, our NBC News YouTube channel as well. Just search Hallie Jackson now. Top story coming your way right now. Stick around. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.